What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Altitude Show. I'm your host, Dave Brinker. The Altitude Show is presented by Mountain Tough. Two months, 26 days, about eight hours until hunting season. We all need to be prepping um, Mountain Tough's preseason 2.0 program on their app is what I'm using to get prepped because two months and 26 days is not a lot of time. Um, and I'm doing that about four days a week right now. And it is an amazing program. I've seen remarkable changes in my body and just my my endurance and my strength. <clears throat> but they also have their on-ramp program for those that are just getting started in their fitness journey or their minimal gear daily program um, where you don't need a lot of gear. You can do it from home and it usually takes about 30 minutes. There's really not an excuse to uh, not be prepping your mind and your body for hunting season and the backcountry. It takes a lot out of you. Um, if you're interested in Mountain Tough, go to mountaintough.com forward slash Dave. Use my code Dave at checkout for a discount and you will not regret it. All right. So this week we have my friend Zion Pilgrim on the podcast. Zion is a outfitter, a guide, and a hunter in New Zealand. And I, I went and hunted with him in uh, 2015. I've known him for probably about 10 years now. Um, Zion grew up in a religious community, some would label as a cult, um, I would, uh, called Gloria Vale. There's actually a documentary on Netflix called Gloria Vale, where you can just Google it, YouTube it, look up Gloria Vale, like Gloria Vale. Um, he grew up in that community and in rural New Zealand. When I went down there, I actually stayed there because that's where they were based out of for their hunting outfit. Um, and... Basically, he ended up leaving the community here a couple years ago or within the last two years. He's got a pretty remarkable story. They've had their share of issues, including sexual assault allegations that ended up becoming true and other stuff. And just, you know, general problems that you have with these communities, controlling people's lives, controlling communication, controlling education, controlling money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Zion and his wife and his many, many kids left within the last couple of years. They are living freely and still um, devout Christians, but um, practicing in a way that is actually free. So we spend a lot of the time on the podcast around Gloria Vale and sort of how it works, what it was like growing up there, what it was like leaving there, some of the problems they've had. We also talk about New Zealand conservation, politics, stuff like that. Um, and we were doing it, obviously, he was in New Zealand at the time. And when you're recording these remote podcasts, especially if someone's out of country, sometimes there can be a few little glitches. So apologize for that. I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Here's Zion. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. As I described in the intro, we have Zion Pilgrim in the room digitally flying all the way over the Pacific Ocean from New Zealand through the ether. And uh, he's sitting in his garage. At, what time is it? Like 4.30 in the morning? Uh, just after 5.30. <laughs> oh, that's not too bad. Well, that's not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome, Zion. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I, I did an intro and I kind of described um, sort of our relationship. I've known you for, I think, about a decade. Um, and I hunted with you in 2015 for tar, chamois, fallow deer, stag. And wild pigs and uh that was such an awesome trip man um i i will never forget it it's one of the highlights of my hunting career and less to do with the actual hunting even though the hunting was awesome too it was just the landscape of where we went tar hunting was something i can't describe in words in ter terms of anywhere i've ever been there's nowhere that I've been, including in Alaska or anywhere in the Rockies or anywhere else I've been, that comes to close to the beauty of the South Island. What do they call that, those mountains? Uh, the Southern Alps, and it's particularly on the western side. It's where we were hunting. Yeah, the western Southern Alps. Oh, my God, man. Like, when we flew into that basin, um, you land the helicopter. Well, you fly the helicopter, and he's like, you know, dodging cliffs and all kinds of shit and you land. And I just remember my, like, it took my breath away, dude. It was unbelievable. Just the, 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 the ruggedness, steepness, the, 
it's just I don't know. It looks like it's a, a straight out of like a Narnia movie or like a Lord of the Rings or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. It's a it's just an incredibly beautiful place, and um, you know, even though I've been hunting there for for over twelve, thirteen years, or well, coming up fifteen years total, if, if you had COVID, um, you know, it's still it's still takes my breath away every every time I, I hunt in those places they're just incredible such a great experience um so how long have you been guiding down there zion uh since 2008 was the first season so um 15 years minus the COVID years i mean i did i did some guiding through COVID, but um not a lot i mean once once the the government let us out um I went hunting with with my friends and my kids and um i think i think i shot more more tar that that year that winter in uh 2020 than i have uh well ever myself um and with friends and family so it was it was good to get out that's for sure um but yeah coming up it'll be 15 years now after this season so we've just we've just finished the season now from um late february through till through till now we're just wrapping it up so yeah mm -hmm. it's um it's been good been really and you good. and you've kind of grown to specialize in tar tar is kind of your mainstay right yeah for me for me personally it, it would be my favorite um just because you know i just love i love where they go i mean they're a, an incredibly impressive animal but um i just love the places they live they're a mountain goat um places they go just just as a species i mean the such a great species and and there's a there's a real conservation um element to it as well that you know as far as a for a game animal we, we have new zealand has the the best tar population and the best huntable tar population anywhere in the world and that's that's actually really special and and we need to we need to know that we need to value it and we need to preserve it um because they you know recently they have been under threat and um, as as a game species, they just need to be managed, and um, from from a government and level um, hunting organisations, and um, and yeah, they're they're incredible to hunt. They're they're great to rifle hunt. They're great to bow hunt. Um, they're great to camera hunt. I've I enjoy all three. So <laughs> yeah, right. it's a good time. Yeah, they're, they're a beautiful animal. And I, yeah, they're basically just a um, to me like they live in the similar places a mountain goat would live down there. They live in the yeah. most extreme high places and uh, some of the most severe country I've ever been to, too. That's I I don't love heights. That's why I'm primarily an elk hunter because elk hunting, you generally don't aren't cliffing out. Um, yeah. But there was a couple times on that trip we were, in my opinion, pretty cliffed out and that one night in the fog. And like we were like traversing yeah. down like a, a dry uh, waterfall, basically, <laughs> uh, in the fog. <laughs> uh yeah that that where they live is crazy man but they are a beautiful animal especially as it gets later in the season they have that long hair i ended up shooting um i uh shooting one with a rifle down in the bottom of the canyon down by camp which is super convenient but uh yeah that's still the longest shot i've ever made on an animal zion even though it wasn't even that long uh, it was decent. What was that? Uh, Four seventy was it? About that from memory. I'm trying to remember. No, no, it was uh, six forty. I thought really? it was. Yeah, it was something like that. It, okay, that's what yeah, I that, remember. That I, 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 I can't it remember. Why was it get there? It was. It was something like that. Yeah, I remember walking to it, and I'm like, dude. No, you know what? It wasn't six forty. It was five eighty five. It was 585. Okay. I remember Which that. Which is still clearly. a long shot. It's a long shot. For me, it, for me, it is. I know I know. there's people out there that are like these amazing thousand yard shots or whatever. But for me, it is that my next longest shot's like 440 on an elk. But I'm just not a long range shooter, right? So, yeah. but uh, it was an amazing trip, man. And it's been a long time since then. I need to get back down there. I know it's partly my fault. Um, but, you know, actually, it's all my fault. Uh, so Zion, can you give a little bit of a, a little bit of history of your life? Because I want to talk a lot today about where you grew up and the community that you left. Um, yeah. can you give a little bit of background into that? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was born, 
in a in a religious community, um, very conservative, um, fundamentalist, really. Uh, the community is now called Gloria Vale. Um, there's been a lot of media attention in recent years, um, a lot of legal focus. Um, I've been quite a bit of, I've played a, a reasonable role in some of the recent legal legal stuff, just um, trying to help improve the place and um, for the people that are still there, including a lot of my family. So I, I was born um, into this religious community along with uh, my wife was as well. You know, we, we, the early part of our lives was, was entirely there and even starting our family were married there. We, we, I mean, we only left in 2020. So to coming up, coming up three years ago in September. So um, definitely the biggest part of my life um, was spent in that, in that community growing up. Um, and just an overview of the community is that it's a, it's a, an intentional Christian community is, is what they would call themselves. Um, very, very fundamentalist though, and very, very restrictive in as far as, um, even from a Christian perspective. And, and I don't mean that in a good way. It's, it's, um, yeah, very, very limited and just, just from a physical, um, Overview: There's there's approximately 600 people that live there, about 80 to 90 families. Um, they own about 5,000 acres of land, uh, maybe a bit more now. Um, net worth is a, is approximately 45 million uh, New Zealand. So, which is not, you know, that sounds like a big number, but it's not really a lot. Have spread over 600 people or 80 families. Um, but it's it's certainly a very large operation. So they have a number of business avenues, uh, a lot of dairy farming, um, a rendering factory. There's a number of things that they do to support themselves. And then um, all the money, everything, all the income comes into a central office, which is then used to provide for everyone's needs. And so it's it's um, it's community slash communism. Um, where no one has any money, but then also in theory, there's no need for any money. Um, so it's one big happy family full of shiny happy people. <laughs> to, to call yeah, when I, what, maybe when I was when I was down there, um, I didn't see. I saw the men; they were all wearing coveralls, correct, like blue coveralls or something. Yeah, and uh, I didn't see very many women. I think I saw a van drive by one day, and it seemed like they wouldn't even look at me, but um, yeah. uh, tell me about, you had mentioned before that marriages are arranged, correct? Yeah. yeah. So can you talk a little bit to that and how you met your wife? Um, so we, your marriages are completely arranged um, for a number of, you know, they, they would teach, well, you know, God knows who the best person is for you to marry. So you need to seek God's will in your marriage, which is, is great. But then how do you find God's will? You find God's will through talking to the leaders or, you know, one specific leader. And at that time it was the founder, it was my, my wife's grandfather. Um, and so, and, and then that I guess is, is something to take note of is that they basically would say that God's will for your life and for everything can, will only come through the leadership, which, which is actually the point of power. And it's the, and if you have that level of control over people's lives, and then you have the physical control over where they live, what they eat, what they, who they marry, you know, that's, that's a lot of control. And so that's in the, in the marriage domain, that's, that's how it works. Um, you know, fortunately for me, and, you know, obviously God had, did have mercy and I, and I, and I, I, my wife and I were, were married, even though it was arranged, it was certainly a lot better than I could have ever hoped for. And, um, and, you know, she's my number one best person in the, in the planet and, um, best friend and, and everything. So in spite of that arrangement, it's, uh, it's worked out very well for me and, um, uh, for us and for our, our family. Um, but that's, that's not always the case. Um, because there's not a lot of the normal social constructs that would would stop people getting married who aren't necessarily 
good people or or wouldn't treat their spouse well or and you know so there were marital problems and issues as a direct result of that and very little that anyone could do about it you know there's women that were in abusive relationships where their husbands were just terrible and and they were essentially told well there's nothing you can do about it and kind of suck it up so that that then affects the behavior of of the person that's being abusive as well so can you call the police like if you're getting physically abused like or how does that work uh maybe now but certainly not then um and that was one of a wow. huge bug there for me and which contributed to to us leaving as well as i but had been on a on a crusade so to speak within the within the sort of leadership group that that you know we have to have the police more involved because there was things that that were coming up things that i had been unaware of and and i said you know anything that goes on people must be free to contact the police which was actually really new for us growing up um, we did not view the police as as something that was accessible or or there to help us and i remember even as children i mean everything from the outside world we were afraid of because that's what we were taught and and so um I was I was thinking back actually as a child a lot of my memories were very happy memories growing up um but then I was you know I remember points of fear was when I met people from the outside and until obviously I learned that it wasn't all bad you know um so that that certainly changed my perspective as as I grow up but it's um it's just another control mechanism um but certainly I would I I believe now that uh, with the amount of focus and pressure and and through the courts and everything that that people would be free to contact the police directly if if they were in an abusive relationship or any any form of abuse um yeah. so there was there was like at that time at that time there was yeah. no phone like you didn't have access to a phone yeah not really um there was only landlines and they were you had you couldn't ring out directly you had be, to be connected through an operator through and they would write down who you were ringing and why. Um, so oh, certainly wow. if you were calling the police, it would, it would, you'd be on the radar. <laughs> oh my God, dude. That's gotta be so scary for someone in an abusive relationship. Like there's no out, like you're just stuck. Yeah. And that's, that's why I think things went on for so long that weren't, weren't good because people didn't know what they could do about it and especially mm -hmm. especially for people who had been victims of abuse you know what can they do and especially if they were then told that that they were the problem you know well you just mm -hmm. need to do this or you need to do that rather than putting the focus on on um, on the perpetrator the focus on the offender so a lot of these mm -hmm. people um I, I know several cases where with younger women you know they they were suicidal because they didn't have the tools to do anything about it um and also even if they even if they brought things out then then it would reflect badly on them maybe maybe they wouldn't be allowed to be married because you know they were just being a slut or whatever so so there's just yeah some pretty unhealthy stuff and and hopefully hopefully a lot of that's been thrashed out and worked through but i i think a lot of it's still institutional and to people's mindsets and the way they think and then and then woven into some of the christianity faith aspect as well which is which is very unhelpful and also and also not not true <laughs> but yeah and also not 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 in alignment with christianity not <laughs> so, at all. No. yeah no. um um so nobody has their own money what if someone wants to go on a vacation does that is that not a thing um yeah so so you do get a an an allotment of vacation of vacation so you'll get one week a year which you can plan for um so because of one of the founding principles is equality it'd be like well you know you want to do this big trip with your family but not everyone can do that um so so you can't do it and that's pretty much any plans like that were squashed um I remember one time I had planned to take my wife to the states actually on a and I had enough airline credit so I'd actually booked the ticket on credit from from just getting credit with booking flights for hunters and that with a um an airline and so I actually had everything booked and I I still had to talk about it ask about it and it was like well 
why should you go? Why should you why should you be able to take your wife to America? You know, that's that's not how we do things. Um, so that that was denied. So yeah, tag soup. Got to eat that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we we are now planning. Jeez, we are now planning a trip. Um, hopefully um, in January we'll see we'll see how we go. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get her over for the shows and um, that'd mm -hmm. be great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So with okay. That, so with that um, so just with that annual vacation, we would plan stuff. We'd actually have a fun time with the kids. We'd go to the beach. We'd go mountain climbing. Um, things that would stay pretty local and also not cost money um, because we didn't mm -hmm. really have it. So, so it was still good to spend time with the family. Okay. Uh, hold on, just one second. Sorry, I had to fix something on my computer, folks. Uh, okay, so we have we your, your the marriages are arranged. The uh, there is basically, I mean, it's it's a cult. They're controlling everything from communication yeah. to yeah. activity to connections. Um, yeah. What's it like growing up, up in something like that? And like, do you realize it at the time what it is, or is that just normal life? I mean, because you, you probably didn't have a lot of exposure to the outside world until later, right? Yeah, that's correct. Very, very little exposure, and and obviously that's part of that's another mechanism that's used by by those controlling you know cult groups. And so um, we grew up. I remember my childhood pretty happy um, because we you know we spent a lot of time outside. We were playing. We were you know, we had um, at the first community, we had a bit of land. So I used to enjoy um, working. I used to enjoy helping with milking the cows, helping with doing lots of different stuff. I and mean, we, we worked hard, like even as children, we were worked hard in, in big groups of kids with a supervisor. Um, and, and you know, that, that since has been um, gone through the employment, employment court in New Zealand and, um, you know, deemed as as labor that should have been paid for <laughs> funnily enough and um but some of that you know i i value that and it's part of my you know as part of what made me and you know i elements of the, of that i wish even for my for my own young boys that to have those opportunities so i try and provide that but um certainly certainly growing up it didn't feel bad but looking back i can see now the the elements that were even in myself that were unhealthy and unhelpful that didn't create um things created things in me that i had to deal with later that um, could have been done differently and a lot of it was just control and not not being influenced not having it's quite a an encapsulated social structure and so very controlling but um yeah a world within a world really um and very little influence from outside very little influence even from other christian groups other christian people um, that would have had a, a really positive effect if if it had been possible um but yeah it certainly wasn't miserable it was um just our life it was normal and then you know then as you start meeting people as you start working through stuff in your mind then then you come up to these these points of of thought points of of behavior that are like well hang on i've been taught this i've seen this modeled you know how now i'm now this i'm i've got to work my way through um these other issues and and that's when it that's when you start to challenge everything you've been taught everything you've been told your whole life and and normal takes a new direction right right um is there is there a documentary there's a documentary called glory of veil because that's the name of this this community is that on netflix yeah uh yeah it's been in cinemas i think it may be on netflix now it was released last year I, i'm actually in the movie um so that's that's a pretty powerful doco if if anyone wants a, an insight into some pretty some of the darkest stuff and in that i mean um just the struggles families um, have had with with getting kicked out, getting separated. Um, my my brother in law was separated from his wife for four years um, 
and just the mental and emotional and sh- the struggles that he had was, you know, he went to some dark places and it was it was hard for him. And it was hard for me on the inside, on the other side at that time. And then then our family ended up leaving before before my sister came out, um, which was a few months later. But we're, we're all down in South Canterbury now. He's they're doing well. Like, well, we go to the same church. It's really good. And um, uh, but yeah, that documentary is very, very powerful. And certainly anyone that hasn't seen it should um, just because I think there's there's things to learn. And it's and it's even a lot of people aren't aware that places like this still exist today and um, and that there are people that are, are going through these struggles. You mentioned Zion that everything's self sustainable except for uh, in in the community except they 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 don't you don't have doctors necessarily you go outside the community for your medical services is that true yep. Yes that's right yep so they'll have a they used to have a clinic on site where a doctor would come for an afternoon a week and I'm not sure if that still carries on or not that that had gone for a number of years um, and I, I think that's to keep some some professional distance for medical issues was the the reason behind that, just so that you're not prescribing or treatment to your own own friends and family mm-hmm. was the biggest thing I think. Well, folks, as I mentioned, two months, twenty six days, eight hours until hunting season opens, and I have been spending a load of time researching the three or four states that I'm going to be hunting this year, researching the units, the trophy potential, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the ma- maps of where I might be going. I've been making sure that I'm filling holes in my gear, all the things that you need to do in prep, because that is not a lot of time. It's like eight weeks away. So um, I've been putting pretty big dents in it, and I do most of that at gohunt.com. Um, you should become an insider so you have access to all the tools that I do. You should go to their gear shop. They have all the best brands. And when you shop and or join, use my code ALTITUDE and you'll get a significant discount. So there's no excuse not to go do it. Gohunt.com, use code ALTITUDE for a discount. Yeah. Okay. So so we kind of know how it works. And um, and you grew up there. We kind of know how it works, generally speaking. It's very isolated. It's out in the country. There's it's you really don't have to the, the, you're not allowed to check the internet is that kind of the case you're not supposed to interact with the outside world um yeah so it's very restricted so people that have access to the internet there's logins and those people are then checked there's um there's security programs checking the, the websites they're going to there's blockers and and flags and so there's someone in charge of that that will keep an eye on that for for the different people and that's for everyone like all the adults and everything um, so it's, it's very controlled and, and especially for young people, really discouraged. Um, I'm told that recently that young people have more access to cell phones, but it certainly wasn't the case when, when we were there. Um, yeah, so that was very, very restricted the use of cell phones and, and contact outside. Um, yeah. And I remember, I remember for, so, long, so you don't really, oh, go, go ahead. I was going to say, I remember for a number of years when I was a teenager having virtually no interaction with the outside. Like I might go to town once a year. Um, you know, I'd, if I wanted to ring someone, I remember I had a friend even with hunting, even wow. after I was married, where I'd give him, I'd ring him up and talk to him and it'd just be on a landline at, you know, 7.30 at night or 8 o'clock. And that was, that was the only interaction I had. And that was, that was even in my early 20s. So the, the contact was very definitely restricted a lot. And so the community is a Christian community. Can you describe the form of Christianity that's practiced there? Like, is it pretty traditional Christianity? Like what, like give a little mm, bit of context there. Yeah, it's kind of a hard one. It's, it's almost a semi charismatic slash almost Pentecostal conservative. So it's kind of a mix of a, a few different things. The founder was originally um, from a, a Church of Christ background, which is a, de- a denomination, a evangelical denomination. And so he brought some of that to the mix. And then, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, not having hang-ups and, and you know, freedom to, you know, kind of a, a hangover from the 70s and 80s, of, you know, the, the rebellious type 
against culture and against what everyone else is doing and we're going to do our own thing and and so so they would they change so much including the dress code including just you know the names of the week or the months of the year like just just questioning everything like you didn't have wedding bands and um you know so many different things didn't celebrate birthdays or christmas or or anything it was very very restrictive in those in those regards um yeah very conservative but certainly th there's a lot of fear as well even in the from the christian faith perspective um that you know you can't be sure of your salvation you don't know you know, you, there's no understanding of the finished work of Christ, or, or, or you know, things that that we've been very, very blessed to actually grow in our understanding, sort of over the time we were leaving and since that time, um, and now to be part of a of a really healthy church that is still very conservative, but but is just takes away a lot of that fear because a lot of those groups need fear to survive and to continue um and so you know and that's obviously the christian faith is to not have fear um but somehow humans can still turn it on its head back into to that for and it just helps maintain control and, and power and the, the, an ability to to control people um essentially um so yeah. so let's let's talk about that let's talk about that a little bit because um Usually in groups like this, it leads to corruption um, mm -hmm. and other issues. Um, and over recent years, there's allegations of sex abuse um, at Gloria Vale. What do you What do you have to say to those allegations? Because um, and then as a second part of that question, um, just corruption in general and and sort of power. Um, the the power of power and ha and how that all worked and it, how it affected you while you were there. Mm. Yeah, d very definitely. Um, a lot of the allegations that have been made are true, um, and in different facets. I mean, there's always there's always a little bit of ex exaggeration sometimes on how people remember events to happen, and you know, obviously you would expect that. Um, but essentially, yeah, there was some horrific abuse that that happened and even historically even 20 30 years ago um that shouldn't have happened like the founder was put in prison for he was uh, jailed for over sexual abuse and you know i i was a child at that time i was i was about 12 or 13 when that happened um the police came in took him away did a big search of everything and you know we weren't told why we went we never really found out why until until quite recently and we were just told he was being persecuted for being a christian um but he was put in prison we used to go visit him um you know it was still very he still controlled and ran the place from prison and then when he got out he went straight back as the main leader again for another 20 odd years what? yeah and so that that in itself so there's there's actually some massive government failures as well like like knowing someone after someone's been convicted of that to then put them back into a setting where there's a lot of children where they're then also the ultimate leader also in that position of ultimate authority and power i mean power as you know i mean absolute power corrupts and corrupt and power corrupts absolutely and so humans can't handle that level of of control over other people without it without it just getting to them and that's why it's not healthy for them to have it and and so that's 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 really important to recognize as as just a failure in humanity and in, in people that's why we need accountability we need to actually to be to have something to measure up to um and and to perform and that's you know we we actually need that as 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 people so that that is very much the case in the community like there's a lot of power there's a lot of control it's it's held there by restricting knowledge restricting movement communication um, and then also from the the religious teaching side um, to to limit the exposure to to other pastors, other ways of thinking. You know, this critical thinking is discouraged. It's it's it's, it's so parallel with socialism and and what's happened behind the Iron Curtain in, in Europe and in a lot of communist countries, there's a lot of the same tactics. And, and funnily enough, you might think, how can this happen inside a country like New Zealand without the in, without influence from anything else? And, and you just realize, well, it's it's just a part of, of humans and what humans will do when they're given that opportunity. So yeah, pretty interesting. 
Yeah, and it was probably founded, and I don't know a lot about the founding, but my guess is it was probably founded to, uh, in a way, be, become free from control from the government and to practice your religion and mm -hmm. all these things. But it actually does a complete 180 and does exactly what it was running from, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. That's why I think, yeah. I think these these communities are really fascinating. Me and my wife were talking about this one day. It's like what they're trying to get away from, they actually in, end up doing in a worse way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And yeah. so it is really interesting. Okay. To see so, that. so, so go ahead. Uh, no, you're right. You carry on. Uh, so, so, we 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 know sort of how it works and there were for sure some corruption issues some sex abuse issues do, do you think i mean are we going to hear about more and more of this as time goes on or do you think they got to kind of handle on some of that stuff that can the community live in peace and do their thing without these huge issues coming out because it definitely was a huge pr problem for them mm -hmm. um i mean i remember i remember people when when they found out I went hunting there, I remember people sending me articles about the, the sex abuse from there. And I'm like, look, that's like, I, I don't know that guy. I'm a, Zion's my guy. I was like, he, he's, he's the man, you know, I, I couldn't give a shit about whoever that guy is. He deserves to be in prison. Um, yeah. and, uh, the, the people, the people that I met were very, very nice, polite, peaceful people. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to live there. I couldn't do it. Don't want to do it. But personally, I thought it was a very peaceful community. But mm. communities like that tend to always have sexual abuse issues. So um, do you think it can exist without those types of issues cropping up? I think it could. I think it could if, you know, and I've, I've, I've been actively involved over the last two years since, because we, we only left in September of 2020. Um, you know, part of, you know, COVID was a contributor and just having more time to process that. And, and so I think it could, um, but there needs to be a lot of things change still. And, you know, we've been, there's been a lot of public scrutiny. There's been a lot of government scrutiny. There's commissions, there's police investigations that are ongoing. There's currently, um, Glory of Our Males that are in prison and, and they should be. And, and, yeah, so I think I think they're on the right track, um, but I don't think they're there yet. Mainly because the cent the power and control is still held centrally in the same place by the same people, and and those people are answerable for the things they have allowed. And so I still think there's some there's some culpability that that still needs to actually be followed through with and I, th I think it will happen like a lot of that information is in in the public space and also in the hands of the police and so they are working through that process and and you know from you know for the things that that Glorivelle has done you know to help their obviously their PR problem or their to, to be able to continue forward as a as a as a healthy community and a functioning community there's They've put a lot of things in place. They've written gazillions of policies and everything else. Essentially, I don't think the underlying things have changed because they're directly entwined with their with their religious beliefs and faith as, as far as a lot of that goes. But I, I do think they're on the right path. Um, but it's going to take some time and it's going to take some some attrition and some growth and, and, and knowledge and, um, yeah. I, I think if 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 people could come and visit more freely, that would help with that. But that's also so, why they can't. <laughs> go go ahead, finish your statement. Oh, I was just saying that if, if people, like even family members like us, could visit our our family that's in there. More. F uh, yeah, I've got you. I've got you there. I dropped out of I. Back again. Zion. <laughs> Hello, one, two, three, one, two, three, ding a ling a ling. Yes, no. Have I, I got can you? hear you now. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a bit annoying. Um, I'll just finish that thought. Please do. I Start it over, actually. Yep. Okay. 
one of the things that's stopping or slowing down the the forward movement of progress is the lack of ability to visit by people that have left and so so there's still a lot of shunning there's still a lot of separation and you know there's a lot of my family members that that haven't talked to me in over two years like since the day we we left that's they cut you off and they, and they're, they're told they have to do that you know they're told they have to just cut that piece out of their heart and throw it away and bury it and you know you're worse than dead so if that was changed if people could visit family freely and have communication freely it would it would really help in the path forward and help bring that community to a, a healthier position quickly um, faster than it currently is but I, I do think that there is progress being made even still in that in that regard so Tell us about the beginning of when you first started thinking that this might not be for you. And let's walk through that, how that process worked. Um, I don't think it was actually, it just happened like that. It was more, because that was further down the line. It was more that I, because I wanted it to be successful, I was part of the leadership team. I was a trustee on the board. I was very invested. You know, I was in my early 40s. I was very invested with my whole life being tied up in that community while at the same time I was running a, a hunting business I I love my trips to to America to the shows to to catch up with my friends and and to do all that side of it and then part of that too was I got to visit other Christian people I got to to had Christian people come hunting with me that were really great I visited even other communities um, like Hutterite communities up in Minnesota and that where I stayed there I had friends there and I guess that was probably they challenged me on on issues of faith that and things like that were allowed at Gloryvale that they considered to be wrong. Um, and so some of those things like really challenged me as a person, as a Christian. I'm like, hang on, these these guys are better Christians than me, yet I'm from Gloryvale. So how is that possible? So I really wanted to grow personally in my faith and my understanding of God and my understanding of the Bible. And so that's when I started listening and listening to other preachers other pastors podcast or not podcasts more audio audio books um youtube sermons and things like that and then i started sharing those with my wife as well um and I, I knew that i mean we were told that you know with a big family we couldn't survive in the outside world we had to be in the community setting to be able to survive with having the number of kids we had at that time we had 12 12 children of our own um you know just that we'd had over the time we'd 20, 20 plus years we've been married, um, which so they came pretty, pretty regularly. Um, big family, a lot of challenges there. But I, I just knew, I guess what I knew is that if it came down to it, I had to be true to what was right and whatever the cost was. And and I knew that that I'd be okay if I had to go and start again in the outside world. And I knew that I'd be cut off. I'd seen it done plenty of times before to my own family members. Um, you know, as actually that Glory of Our movie is quite good if people want some some context. Um, and also there's we've done a another documentary with the Hope Park Project, um, which is which gives some interesting information as well. But it was certainly a journey for me, and it wasn't really just a light bulb moment. It came right down to the wire once we decided to sit down and write a letter to the main leader just outlining our concerns the things this was during covid the things that we really felt needed to change for for the community to continue or to grow to be a, a healthier community to progress to you know to to improve and in, in areas that were really important and really serious um, like sexual offending and, and reporting that to police and just things that that I couldn't live with in my conscience, that my wife was concerned about, things that were affecting our own family. And so, you know, I, I remember one day just thinking, you know, when, if not now, then when, you know, when am I going to be a man? When am I going to actually grow up here and do what I know needs to be done regardless of the cost? Because I, I knew that it could go one of two ways. Either they would listen or we would have to either not think that way, give up, what I had conviction about, or we'd get the boot and everything that came with that, um, which was what happened. So um, it really wasn't till 
after I gave that letter to the leader and then he came back and said, no, we're not changing anything. We've done this for 50 years. We're not changing because you think we should change. And then there was disciplinary meetings that I just got shredded um, character assassination. You know, you're this, you're that for hours at a, at a time in that group. Um, a couple of those, especially the last one I recorded, and that's been very useful to helping outside agencies understand how those things, the tactics that are used, how the how those things are done. And, and it's also very current and relevant. So that so that um, we've that's been used in court um, with Gloria Vale since in the last couple of years. And and in that last meeting, my wife and my oldest boy, Dan, he was 20 at the time, they were they were in that meeting. And it was really only once we got home we said, look, we've been given an ultimatum. We need to weigh up the pros and cons and whether we can do it or not. And we talked about it and we just said, we can't do it. So we started packing and, and packed all night. I, I wrote a I wrote a paper at, nearly at midnight to, for my accounting degree um, as we were packing. And then the next day we we drove out with our with our 12 kids, pregnant wife, and yeah. a few possessions. So not much. Start again. How did you have a car? Like, where'd you get a car? Um, so they, I had a, I had an old Toyota Prado that I used for the hunting for just driving hunters around. So they gave me that. They said, I, oh, could I think that. I, I think I rode that sucker. Yeah, you did. <laughs> the old crate. I mean, they're, they're a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I think I remember taking a nap in that after we got out of the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we they lent, loaned us a van and a trailer, and, and one of their guys drove because you know we didn't have enough drivers, trained drivers. So one of them drove us down to Fairley um, in South Canterbury, where we had a house lined up um, that some uh, an older family had said we could stay in, um, and we stayed there for four and a half months. So so yeah, we basically were able to just pack up and get a lift out, and yeah, that was it. Start again. That's, that's insane, man. Okay. So Zion, my wife had a, uh, very sort of not a fundamental, fundamentalist religious upbringing. And yep. she sees many parallels between her life and your life. Mm -hmm. And she has questions that she would like me to ask you, um, yep. if you don't mind. And so yeah, no, she's probably a better she's probably a better interviewer than me so these questions are a lot more thoughtful than my off the hip questions yeah um so are you ready for this oh yeah okay as zion was going through his doubts and self-evaluation what were gloriana's thoughts and feelings did you to talk and discuss did it take a while for her to be in the same place or was it a natural progression for you both it, it definitely took a while. And I think the, you know, from her story, from what she saw change things was my life was she saw, she saw the things happening to me that she had wanted to happen as a dad, as a husband, to be, to be more of what I should be and things that she had been trying to help me and you know i mean for a start she was terrified because everything that she was being told everything that she was had been taught her whole life from the other side would would actually force her to to push me aside or to even to report me to say well you know look he's doing this he's doing that you know and and so she was quite very anxious for that but then when she actually saw the progress that i was making personally um that was what actually i think was one of the big things that, that actually helped her and helped her to track along. And then she had, she had a lot of the similar concerns that I had. And then she, and I, I think once we actually started getting the, the sort of better religious instruction um, and, and teaching that, that really just cemented it and solidified it in her, in her mind. Yeah. Has she had, had she had much outside exposure like you had? Um, not a, not a lot. Um, not as much. So I had actually taken her on a few hunting trips, which was, was pretty, um, 
eye-opening for her really and and you know some of her some of her quiet moments of reflection were you know in the middle of a snowstorm on a, inside a heliberg tent on the mountain um you know while we we're waiting for the weather to clear or and you know where she was just listening to an audiobook or just thinking about just having a deep think about our life and about where we were at and where we were going forward. I mean, at one time, actually, that painting in the background we did as a part of the the tar protest back in in twenty eighteen. You know, when the doc was talking about you know culling huge amounts of the tar population. So, uh, my wife and I went and we hunted up in up in a in a valley. Um, she even shot a bull tar just to make me happy, I suppose. And and then we snuck in on some bulls, including the one she painted there. And, you know, I, I got into 30 yards with my big camera and set up my phone scope and, and you know, recording some data, but so so for photos and resources that she then used for the painting. Um, but part of that was we stayed up in a hut in the mountains with a couple of my friends for three days. And, you know, she was in, in sick gear. She wasn't in, in the community long dress and head covering and all that. And so, so just for that was very brave of her and but it also really helped with her with her journey to to see that she actually had a life and a future that wasn't locked into this box and that she it gave her the ability to think critically and 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 i think that was very helpful um those trips away with me so yeah how did your kids especially the older kids handle the thought of leaving the community. Um, so my oldest one, Dan, he was after those meetings that we were in the disciplinary ones. He was he wasn't going to stay anyway. He was already in a lot of trouble with, um, you know, and he's a he's a strong Christian. He's a believer, and and you know he was already challenging a lot of the things from a theological perspective, and and he even helped us in our journey with with understanding a lot of things and we talk about things at night and that so he was very much on board um the younger ones you know they were late teens they were i mean there's an element of excitement but but the biggest impact on them was leaving their friends and that did hurt that took them several years and you know i think i think my my boy he's 11 now he's only just he's still he's been he was angry about that for a long time his best friend his cousin who he went to school with every day he worked you know the boys did organized work after school or play and then you know he was the best of friends well now he hasn't seen him again since that day and that's now now been enforced by that boy's parents and they don't want any contact any letters he wrote have been sent back um so so that was hard on them that was hard on the kids lo losing their friends um but you know at the time at the time they were they were okay with it we just up and went um and so they were all on board and we, we talked about it as a family well more with the older ones and we just talked about our reasons and so so they they were definitely all on board with that All right, another question for my wife. What aspects of, of the community do you and your family miss the most? Um, that's a really, a really good question um, because there are certainly aspects that we do miss. There's certainly... Um, I told you she would have better questions than me. I warned you. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a curly one because... You know, people looking outside will go, oh, you know, you must be just so happy to be outside of that. And I'm like, well, yes, that was necessary and it had to happen. But at the same time, it didn't come without a cost. And it, you know, well, half my family is still there. Um, my wife's four younger sisters are still there with their families. And so we're, we, we don't have any contact with them. Very, very little. Um, my wife visited about two months ago and and had a good catch up with her sisters, but that's really been the first contact. And, and how did she a, do that? Did she get to go in the community and they didn't shun her away? Yeah, yeah. She just asked permission and organised a visit and was allowed to. Um, and I I didn't go because you know I'm probably seen as more of a threat, um, and so I I just wanted her to be able to do that, and that was and it was good. It was it was very it was beneficial it was healing on both sides um but no there's certainly a lot of aspects that we that we miss about it um 
you know, we're, we're thankful for the area we're in, the community with our, you know, the, the church we're in and, and that support. But, but the daily support, the daily interaction, um, inside the community was, was huge and, and constant. In that saying though, like with that, we've noticed our children, our family is a lot more self-sufficient now. Like the kids actually enjoy playing with each other. You know, we've got, we've got three acres just outside of town where the kids, they'll go out and spend three, four hours just building huts in the trees or just playing. And, and, you know, so it's, it's certainly, I think our family unit is, is closer and tighter. Um, but there's certainly, there's even elements of, of, you know, of, Christian faith that of, you know, of service and being willing to give and willing to, you know, we live in a very selfish society and that, that affects everyone and it affects Christians as well to, to not care for others the way we should. And, and so there's elements of that, 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 you know, we would, we sort of want for our kids and we want to just try and teach them in that. I mean, when we go to a fantastic church and, and we get the, we get the hard word, um, which is what we need and good. Um, but yeah, certainly there's a lot of, a lot about the community life that, that we do, that we do miss. Um, but yeah, we didn't, we didn't have a choice really. And you just, you answered a lot of it. Uh, but what parts of the outside world are you thriving in? I, I see you not wearing your, your, your blue coveralls, you know, you're wearing normal clothes. Uh, you know, or do you go out to restaurants and like, is there this, is the, this level of freedom that you feel to go do things and be part of the outside world yeah definitely and um and you know there's there's certainly a lot of positives there in that regard um you know we've we've had to be pretty focused just financially to get established um you know obviously the times we're in are, are, are not easy um but you know we're making progress and and um you know i'm i've certainly i'm happy for where we're at and you know where we're going I, i'm glad to see the the strength and growth in my children um, individually where they're not you know they're not I think they're definitely ahead um, of where they would have been and you know to see my wife just thriving and doing well now is is really good um, yeah I mean it's definitely definitely better um, in pretty much every way there's just not without not without negatives of course that's that's life and so you just got to manage those and and try and mitigate them can you have a beer out in the open now <laughs> yeah yeah I, uh, no problem no problem there and i mean i i never was <laughs> too much into it and i so i appreciate that now um but i certainly enjoy enjoy an occasional beer or a glass of wine so that's good um, <laughs> there you go so let's talk a little bit about um well before i before we before i go on um, my wife, this is more of a statement than a question, but, uh, she, she says your story of questioning and evaluating principles that you had been told are unwavering truths and is an inspiring tale of self-evaluation. We should all be taking stock in what we believe and asking ourselves in all facets of life. If what we stubbornly hold on to is truth al allows for questions, allows for disagreement, honest dialogue, do the tenants we hold on to shun those who disagree and promote us or pr promote an us versus them mentality so it's more of a statement but um mm -hmm. she would love to catch up with you sometime on all that stuff but i, I wanted to ask you i kind of wanted to change directions here a little bit because i'm fascinated by and we're going to do it in in a, in a couple stages one i'm pretty fascinated with the politics of new zealand mostly be, and i didn't really care at all until covid when COVID came along, I started hearing your prime minister speak more. And mm -hmm. I think New Zealand and Australia were like some of the most locked down countries in the world. Um, and, you know, you, you didn't come to the hunting shows. Um, and then once we talk through that a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the, the politics re that relate specifically to conservation and like the outlook for hunting in New Zealand. And then we can, um, you know, go wherever. But what's obviously I don't really care you know whether i'm sure you're a fairly conservative guy but like to me from the outside looking down um it seemed like a fucking pretty crazy uh <laughs> time during covid like you guys literally couldn't leave the country I, I don't know maybe you couldn't even leave 
your communities. I, I don't know exactly how it worked, but how, like, what was your, were you, what, cause you were out of the community by then, right? Or was that about no September 20th? Oh, so you were in the community yeah. until September, but it was still yeah. pretty locked down until like 2021. Yeah, really. It was only, it was only the end of May last year, 2022, that we could, that we could really do anything. Um, and then, and then they just dropped everything. So I'm not sure why, but New Zealand, well, I, I obviously I, I understand that they made so much headway in their ability, like the government made so much headway in their ability to control people at the flick of their fingers. And, and they used all those same things of fear and, and, you know, controlling information. And, you know, they, I mean, our prime minister even said that her, her, um, her news announcement was to be the sole source of truth for the country on what's going on with COVID. <laughs> and, and the the oh crazy thing is you know, we've heard all this stuff. And so we just came from that, you know, and so it was so obvious what was going on in the, in the power play and the politics and the, and then the misinformation and, and everything that was just being used to control people through fear. And, you know, it worked very well. And so, yeah, New Zealand did lock down. We locked down hard. Um, and even that even came into where they, then said churches weren't allowed to meet as well and so funnily enough we we met we had church at our at our property for three months you know with 100 plus people every sunday and did so, you guys get ever ever get in trouble oh uh, no no our neighbors are good um and so no it was it was really good you know we'd have 40 cars on the lawn and and it was amazing it was very good and so i, I think because our church didn't separate between vaxxed and unvaxxed and we, you know we just shrugged it off um that really helped us you know other other churches where some of my family go are still are still now still just struggling with the with the the, the wounds that were caused during that time um, between different sides so yeah, from a country perspective, we did. We locked down hard. Um, you know, our government was saying, you know, we're not going to have all the deaths that everyone else has had and, you know, we're going to stop COVID. And, you know, I was out hunting. I just started a hunting season. I was on my third hunt and, um, and we, you know, our whole season locked down. We had people, um, that were coming in that were even in New Zealand had to turn around and go straight back out. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty crazy. It was pretty mad, really what happened and and you know now looking at it, it just seems so irrelevant um but to look at the i just think that that as a country the government just gained so much control um and you know which is what governments like and so that was that was what came out of it really yeah and those policies that they enacted during that time they they don't go away right yeah, well, they do it under emergency safety mandates, and so they, yeah, they they pass a bunch of laws that that give them more ability to do that and to do it quicker and harder. Um, and so, yeah, those are those are now in law, and um, not a lot we can do about it. Even though we're, you know, we all get to vote this year, but um, yeah, hopefully that has a change of government. But we'll see. <laughs> It's really, it's, it's actually kind of funny. I don't know if it's actually not funny, but uh, a couple days ago, I was reading the news and there was an article that popped up that said that the top 10 freest countries and uh, New Zealand was like number four or five, something like that. And uh, I don't know if that's true or false, but based on what I do know, it doesn't seem, I know it's a wonderful country. But it seems like the government's pretty heavy handed. Yeah. Yeah, they are in, in many ways. Um and I think I think they're just using that same model of you can't trust people to make the right decision. So you make that decision for them and then just tell them what they must do. And you know, well we we came from that. <laughs> That's the same it's the same ideology of, of, of Glory of Allen of that. But it's based in socialism really. And so that's that's mm -hmm. kind of the link that's the leaning strongly but leaning of our previous prime minister I, th I think the guy that's in there now chris hipkins he's doing a better job but it's he's still trying to put out some of the fires mm. that, that that jacinda created and yeah i i, th I think it's mainly because it's an, an election year um you know he was he was too i see through all of that and through COVID, he was there doing those announcements so 
yeah, I don't, I don't really see it as very positive from from the current the current government. Did she resign? Yeah, she she jumped out just enough time before the election to uh-huh. give the her replacement time to to do some stuff and to actually reverse some of the most harmful policies that she had. Can you hear me? She had, yeah. Um, hey, what what did you say? She said that I am the truth, or what did she say? She said she said that she is the sole source of truth um, for New Zealand. And so basically trying to stop people listening to um, anti-vax rhetoric or um, anything that was in opposition to what she was making in her daily news announcements regarding COVID. Yes, yes, she resigned um, a few months ago now. So the new guy's been in, Chris has been in for a while. He's, He's definitely, you know, revoked some of her most controversial and harmful policies, which I think... I think she did that intentionally before the election because their their polls were just were just bottom just diving, and so he's he's actually boosted some support for their party. So you know they've got a chance going into the election, and I think that was just a political move on her part, um, timing wise. It's you know it was done before by by Helen Clark and other other politicians as well. Do you does New Zealand historically usually have a more left leaning and more right leaning government? Um, we really flip flop between both. So we've got, so our current Labour government is, is definitely centre left, like quite, quite hard left leaning, very socialist. And then, um, then the National Party, which is, is more of a centre right, is becoming more and more <laughs> liberal, more and more, uh, left leaning, but they're still definitely more on the side of business and, and, you know, to support people in that regard and reduce taxes, reduce um, the national debt and, and to help people and businesses to thrive. So what's it, so you flip flop. So what's it like being a gun owner and a hunter and a very conservative person um, in New Zealand? Um, like what's the future hold? Cause I, I read some of the other statements that she specifically had. I know she's out of office, but about, you know, buying back guns and destroying them and all this other nonsense. Um, and then also, I don't know if she was involved uh, with some of these policies to severely, uh, or at least get rid of, of a lot of the population of tar on the islands. Um, what's the future of hunting down there and guns and just, I don't know, just that lifestyle. Yeah, I, I think it's positive. I think it's very positive. Um there's kind of a couple of facets to that um you know the the jacinda had a, had an agenda about the the firearms especially the military style semi-automatics ar-15s that sort of thing so so because of her agenda that was already in place to get rid of them when when the Christchurch shooting happened and you know that was a, a a needless tragedy it was a terrible thing to happen but but rather than actually targeting the the failures in the government system and the police and every and all the indicators and the reports that should have stopped that happening, she just went straight for the guns because that was on her agenda. It was something easy and public to do, and um, there was no discussion. It was just like it's the guns' fault. We're doing this, and so I mean, she's done speeches over in America about how successfully she uh, removed all these firearms from gun owners. And, and, you know, the silly, I mean, there's so much involved in that and it, it, it'd be another whole conversation. But the crazy thing is the, the number, the, the gun crime is the same or higher because it's not law abiding gun owners that are committing those crimes. And that's not a way to stop it. So, so, um, you know, we can still have hunting rifles and, and everything we need to go hunting and, and have a future in hunting, um, and guiding and, and all that sort of thing is, is, Unhindered. I mean, they are now bringing in a gun registry um, this month, which we used to have. We got rid of it, um, so there is some tightening up, which you know, it's it makes it harder, but it doesn't make it that hard. And you know, it's still relatively inexpensive to to go hunting and and to to own firearms is is not not difficult. Um, so, which, which I'm glad for. And I, I think in the future there will just needs to be reasonable politics around that and and I think it's it's looking positive we do have a lobby group we do have some pushback from from firearms owners um 
you know, to be reasonable. And, and I think that's, that's well in place. Um, from a hunting perspective, you know, there was all of that publicity. And I remember with the, with the tar culling and all that, that was more related to one minister who is now gone. And so that was her, her private axe to grind and, and, you know, her crusade was against the tar. And so, because there was, was room within the regulation, you know, by misconstruing it a little bit, but within the Wildlife Management Act, um, she was able to do that. Fortunately, we do have some things in place with the Game Animal Council, um, through the Professional Hunting Guides Association. There are organisations and, and legal process that is, is actually controlling that now through we have a tar foundation we have actually the management of these animals is, is being controlled by someone outside of department of conservation but yet they get to contribute so so i think it's really positive there's a good healthy population of tar there's there's a lot of good bulls around um you know we can we can hunt unrestricted um like we well, like we always did um, but the, the thing that that America does so well is game management, and and you know you guys have got a long a lot of history in, in effective game management, and I would love for New Zealand to have something more that way. The part of the problem is that people can come here, and, and people that live here can hunt twenty four seven, three hundred and sixty five days a year, and so there's no game monitoring or management. Um, and so essentially there's not really a lot of value put on them and then by law they're still classified as a pest so why would you value them if it's classified as a pest so there's a huge amount of education um, needed in that space there's just some really 180 degree changes in people's thinking needed to value our game animals and to protect them and to manage them and to minimize the impact on the environment and and just manage it that's all it needs and it can be done very well but it's just we've got a long way to go to get to that yeah that's interesting they're classified as pests um why hasn't there been any effort to create a management system um sort of like i guess our departments of yeah, I'm, I'm assuming you have a department of wildlife or forestry like aren't there public sort of governmental departments that are in charge of the wild things from like all the resources i mean I'm, i know i'm kind of stupid on this subject but yeah no we do we do have um some things in government in place but they're very I mean, the, the main government department is the Department of Conservation, and that's that's not really about conserving introduced species. It's just about the land and then the native species, which are just birds. And so that, their mandate is for that. So they're, part of their mandate is to control invasive pests, which is what everything else fits into. Um, so there's there's certainly some some movement needed there. There's been there's been advances with the Tar Foundation and with the Game Animal Council. These are in law. And so these are organizations that that are there to to represent and to to put forward the interests of the game animals. But on the other side, there's organizations like Forest and Bird who are very strong lobbyists mm -hmm. against introduced species of all of all all those animals that we that we see as as game animals. So yeah, there's quite a lot of what's that parrot? What's the what's the parrot called that we saw? Uh, the Kia, the Alpine the parrot Kia, animal, the, the Kia, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the state bird, right? Uh, no, those are the state bird is Kiwi. So the, the Kia are a parrot that live in the mountains. They're the only Alpine parrot in the world. Um, yeah, they've ripped up a few of my tents, uh, <laughs> but they're very inquisitive, <laughs> and, and so yeah, they're a pretty cool bird. They're awesome, man. I I think when we were going over the past between Christchurch and is it gray mouth or whatever they, what, that pass um when we stopped up there there was a there was several of those parrots just kind of sitting on the guardrail um yep. if i remember if my memory is serving me correct they're they're awesome looking birds um yep. tell me a little bit about the operation now because you're, you're you're now operating on your own obviously mm -hmm. uh tell me tell the tell the listeners um because i'm about ready to give a pretty big spiel on why they should go to new zealand and hunt with you so Give us the down low on your operation and what you do and sort of generally where it's at and uh, what you specialize in. Mm -hmm. So right right before we left um, Gloryvale, we, um, I was 
instrumental in selling the hunting business that I had built um, and been a part of for 12 years. Sold that to um, a company called Monarch, Monarch New Zealand, which was owned by uh, Luke Romano, who was a retired All Black rugby player, professional rugby player. Just and so that's he'd always been a keen hunter, and that so that went went very well right before we went, and then he gave me a job, um, which was great to have, <laughs> with leaving the community and and everything. Um, we have that came with a lot of our booked hunts. You know, a lot of my friends and clients that came from from wilderness quest then this year we've we've done a lot of hunting with monarch um with those clients so moving forward um now i have i've started my own company which is zion hunt nz um pretty direct just for for personal people coming to hunt with me personally and and it's it's more set up for a boutique you know not a high volume because obviously with my family mm -hmm. commitments i'm i'm wanting to just do still keep a hand in hunting and, and take out people that specifically want to hunt with me um just several groups a year that kind of thing and so i'm still i'm just negotiating where i'm going to do that um and i'm wanting to it's looking like i'll keep working with monarch and with with their hunting areas and, and access and and then i'll do some some wilderness hunting like like what we did on the west coast helicopter and um, hunting public land for tar and chamois and that sort of thing so we'll still be offering I'll, I'll be able to offer everything that I did before, um, but it'll be my own operation and and directly controlled and run by me and yeah, guided by me. And that's yeah, it's pretty exciting actually because it's um, yeah, it's great to be doing my own thing and and being able to be a part of that and to benefit my family and and to stay in an industry that I love and doing a, a job that I'm passionate about and. Um, love to be a part of so i'm planning on being back at dallas and wild sheep in january and um yeah catching up with a lot of my friends and and just in a, in a new in a new role new direction so do you have a website yet uh currently working on it but um yeah mainly just through instagram and and i've got my email set up and everything else so um yeah currently just working on a working on a website but it'll just be um zionhuntnz.com that's awesome, man. I'm so stoked for you. You're such a good dude. Um, and what an incredible story. I'm just going to put it on record that you should write a book. Um, yeah. but I'll let you decide that since you have 13 kids, um, yeah. you know, finding, finding the time to do that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not, but yeah. folks, if you have not been to the beautiful country of New Zealand, I know it seems out of reach and it does cost money, mm -hmm. but if if you have the ability to save some money, the plane tickets down there aren't always that expensive, especially if you plan out a ways. Um, it's not actually as crazy as, as you think. Actually, when I went, I think my plane ticket was seven hundred and fifty dollars in twenty fifteen. Um, so you can find deals. Um, it is somewhere if you are an outdoors person. It is somewhere that you should be required to go because. As I said in the beginning of this podcast, the mountains there are absolutely magical. The people are wonderful. Um, the food wasn't very, it was okay. Now, your food was great at the place, but I'm saying like when we went out, like by the airport and stuff, it's like New Zealand's not known for its cuisine. However, the people are amazing. The mountains are amazing. The hunting, my God, it's just, it's just, uh, it's hunter's heaven. Um, I would highly recommend Stag is amazing. Um, but if you're going to go down there, just take the helicopter into the mountains and go all the way to the top and hunt chamois and tar. Do it before the snow hits so it's not super dangerous. Do it, you know, what was I on, like March, April is kind of the best time, right? Yeah, April, May is, is ideal. And into June, like even now, is still good. Okay. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll get off my commercial for New Zealand, but it, I really folks, if you love the outdoors, please save up for it. Do it once in your life if you need to. Um, but generally speaking, the people that I've known that have gone there end up going there multiple times. Um, and if you do go check out Zion, he's a, he's a great dude, great guide, amazing eyes, incredible marksman. He will find you the tar of your dreams. He's like the tar master. That's like, like I said, um, 
And so anyways, no, man, I, I appreciate you, Zion. And when you're up for wild sheep, we'll do a podcast in person. So we don't have technical issues because, you know, it is pretty amazing. We can do a podcast from you know, 6,000 miles away. So, you know, there's bound to be some issues. Uh, appreciate you coming on today. And, uh, uh, folks go check out Zion, follow him on Instagram. And, uh, also I guess we should mention Zion. What, if you're interested in the Gloria Vale story, there is a documentary on Netflix, I think called Gloria Vale. Um, Zion also has his story on YouTube. I think I can't remember Zion. Can you remember what that's titled? Yeah, it's under the hope project. And so if you just look, look up hope project and then Zion, you'll, you'll find it the 20 minute, watch the 20 minute longer, longer one. It's good. Yeah, I know it was really good. Buddy, I appreciate you so much. I got to get back to the family here, but let's do this again and, you know, enjoy your Saturday because you're a day ahead of me already. Yep. No, thank you, David. And uh, I've really enjoyed being on the show and look forward to catching up. Thank you very much. Absolutely, man. Thank you. With hunting season coming up so soon, there's never been a better time to get better at your craft. And the only way that you can do that is either by practicing it or learning from those that are considered the best. And there's no better place to do that than outdoorclass.com where you sign up similar to masterclass and you learn from people like Randy Newberg, Remy Warren, Corey Jacobson, and many others. And you learn how to do the things that they do so awesome. Um, when you go there, go to outdoorclass.com, use code altitude, get 20% off your subscription and you'll have access to these amazing classes. I think we should all be students our entire life. You, can, you never know enough. Um, put the ego aside. Go learn. Outdoorclass.com. Use code ALTITUDE for a discount.